We're here at the beautiful Yamaha Studios in Midtown Manhattan. So thank you to Yamaha and thank you to the American Pianist Association for allowing all of this to happen. Now we're gonna get into the music, that's what you're here for. Now if you can see, we've got two of these beautiful instruments with us tonight. We've got two special guests that are gonna play together, they're gonna play separately, they're gonna let the music flow, and we want you to flow along with the music. So without further ado, I'd love to welcome pianist Sullivan, Sullivan Fortner, excuse me, <laughs> as well as pianist Adam Birnbaum. Welcome.
All right. <laughs> That's right. You know, even though there's just a few people in the room, that round of applause is always on time and so necessary. And it's uh, Sullivan Fortner, ladies and gentlemen, of course, Adam Birnbaum. We're going to get to Adam in just a bit. You know, it's so amazing when you think about this instrument, the piano, the different directions that it can go in. And, you know, I have to tell you something. When I first met with these two gentlemen a couple of hours ago, I said, well, what are we gonna play? Like, what's our set list? And they said, we don't know. And so when I said that we are really gonna flow with the music and the music is gonna flow, that's exactly what I meant. And the amazing thing that happened in just this first 10 minutes is that we got a sample of how different this instrument can be. Adam swinging it for us in the first few minutes and then Sullivan just slowing it down. Man, all right. This music is certainly beautiful, it's certainly powerful, and I can't wait to talk to you both about this instrument. What I love about talking to musicians is that I get to really get in their minds about what they play. This instrument is not just an instrument. I feel like there's always a connection and a relationship that we're gonna get to dive into. So, Sullivan, let me turn your microphone on and get the folks ready to talk to you, Mr. Sullivan Fortner. You know, the last time you and I saw each other was at Dizzy's. I think it was one of the last gigs that I did that m maybe any of us did going out before things shut down. We didn't know it was gonna shut down, and I think we even said to each other, I'll catch up with you another time. So it's good to see you, and even better to hear you. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, really an honor to be here with my friend, yeah. Uh, we go back a few years and uh, we play with some of the similar people and we studied with some of the same guys. So it's really cool to have this little exchange with him. Oh yeah, and I can tell that you guys knew each other. You can tell there's no strangers here because the music just spoke to each other. You guys mm -hmm. spoke through this instrument. I mean, the community is so small. I mean, you know, we all know each other, you know, so. And we're all friends and we're all brothers and sisters in the music, you know. I always say that our DNA is the music. That's Not what that I right. often say, that's our bloodline. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Most definitely. Well, speaking of DNA and bloodline, Mr. New Orleans, right? Am I right? Yep, born and bred. All right, I should have known. Because New Orleans people, the way they talk, it's, you just kind of get drawn in. Yeah, I mean, I've kind of lost a little bit of the a little zest, so to speak. Being here in New Being York? Being in New York, but every time I go back, you know, I come and I, I go back to New Orleans and I come back to New York, people are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, I say, hey, baby, what you doing? Yeah, and it turns into a, a whole thing with me, so, yeah. New Orleans is in my heart, always and forever. Oh, yeah. And talk to me about uh, New Orleans and uh, Sullivan Fortner. Uh, this instrument, the piano, when you talk about New Orleans and jazz, I mean, wow, there's so much that comes with that, but for you personally, uh, talk to me about your first, your first moments with this oh. instrument. Um, it, it started with love. Mm. Uh, it started with a crush that I had with the choir director at the church. So when I say it started with love, it literally started with love. I was in love with this woman. She smelled like cocoa butter and chocolate, and she had blonde hair, and I just was like, you know, it's an unbelievably beautiful woman. And she was playing this instrument, and I was like, I wanna grow up and play just like her. And you know, and then the rest is just 
been following that love, you know. <laughs> Sometimes it's kind of going downhill, but you know. <laughs> but you know. were you thinking about love with that first that first tune there? Um, I was actually thinking of uh, one of my mentors, uh, whose birthday we celebrated earlier this month, um, Mr. Roy Hargrove. All right. And that was a tune that we played a lot. You know, it's like for like the seven years I was in that band, we probably played it like every night. Wow. And uh, that alone would never let me go with like the two staples. And so whenever I play this song, I think about him. Yeah. So you didn't have a plan, but when you came and sat down at this instrument, you knew that Roy yeah, he spoke to you somehow. You know, I, I kind of got to go back. You know, always every time I play, it just takes me back to that place and being in his band and learning from him. You know. And talk to me a little bit about that because we are all, I know for me, Roy Hargrove was someone who made me feel like I was a part of this music, even though I didn't know a lot about it at one time. He made me feel like I could just kind of come on in and, and be a part of it. So talk to me about working with Roy Hargrove, because seven years is a, a long time. Yeah, you know, and in the beginning I was very, very naive. I don't think, I'm, I'm kind of ashamed to say this, but I wasn't really too familiar with his music when I joined his band. And I wasn't very familiar with, I wasn't aware of how many people were directly influenced by him until I joined his band. And then I went back to my days studying Oberlin and I realized that, oh, okay, you got that for Roy, you know what I mean? <laughs> and then, you know, playing in his band and sitting under him, um, every day was, every day was just something, he, he never spoke, he never had a whole lot of words to say, but he spoke through his instrument. Right. Wow. Mm -hmm. And that's a, you know, you can say a lot, and you can say a lot of powerful things. That's right. Through your instrument. That's right. And I think you did that just even to help start things off tonight. So I thank you for that. We're going to get back to you, because I know we're just getting started. I'm going to head on over to Adam and chat with him for a bit, because Adam decided he was going to start tonight's show swinging and getting my toes tapping. I think Adam knew that I just needed to shake some blues off. And you helped us to do just that. So let's talk about what you got started with tonight and what, what made you get with that? Because we didn't know what we were doing, but we know we were doing something. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, uh, that's Love Walked In. It's a, it's a Gershwin tune. And uh, I was kind of thinking about, you know, I miss a lot of things from performance, but I especially miss Monday nights with the Vanguard Orchestra. And uh, it's one of those tunes, a lot of times we start the set with that tune. It's actually the title backwards, Thad wrote a different melody on the same changes, but uh, it's just sometimes you just dive right into the changes, you just start playing, and that's kind of a nice way to get into the set rather than overthink, try to be too uh, esoteric or whatever, so I found it's good to just launch into a tune that's very familiar like that from the start to just kind of get things going. Well, you helped to get things going, it felt good. So we're Thank gonna you. get back, because we're, we're gonna do something kind of fun. We're gonna do solo, and then these guys are gonna talk to each other through the instrument. You've already been doing that, but we're gonna get into you a bit, because I would love to know as well with you, uh, just your first, your first, you talked about love leading him to uh, this instrument. I would love to know what, what got you here. Everyone has a different story in a different lane. Sure, I mean, I don't have quite as direct a story like that, but I mean, we had a piano in my house, and I was just gravitated towards it from a very young age and I used to ask my parents kind of take lessons and they said no you're too young so I just we were always listening to records around the house a lot of classical jazz Beatles different stuff so I picked up a lot of stuff by ear then eventually I got a teacher and he taught me that I couldn't just fake my way through everything I had to learn how to read music which is very important to learn so you know and then it's just been a I mean I officially started learning jazz when I was maybe 12 I guess but I had always started by ear so I, as soon as I, someone played some Miles Davis for me at this summer camp, like a music camp, and I just remember listening to Miles Davis and it just clicked. I was like, yes, that's, that's what I want to do. I want to figure out that. I went to music that. camp. They never played Miles Davis. That must have been a really cool music camp. Yeah, well, you know, it was, uh, it was at New England Conservatory up in Boston. They ran some kind of a camp. I don't remember what it was called, but yeah, it was for classical musicians, but we all had to take a jazz class, which is a great thing that to do for young, you know, aspiring classical musicians, just throw them in there. I mean, that's how it all started for me. Someone showed me how to play a blues and stuff, and then that was it. Well, from it's then all on. connected. Absolutely. I yeah. mean, some of the best musicians they start was through classical. They they know classical jazz. Let's talk about the Beatles and jazz. What were some of your favorite um, records coming up? Because you know, in the radio, even though I don't play music, I play music. I play a lot of Beatles. 
Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they wrote some great tunes and they were very influential, you know. Um, so, you know, I think their later work, especially when they were the tunes like Blackbird, I mean, those are like, those are like standards just like any other standard now, right? They wrote some really beautiful music. Um, but that was kind of my gateway. I had a Beatles fake book and then I learned jazz later, you know, but seeing the chords, the first thing I had was a Beatles fake book. That's how I sort of, my gateway into, everyone has to start somewhere. That's right. You know. Well, we're going to get back into the music now. You both, do, you guys are going to just kind of play off of one another and have a good time and just fly. Well, I think we'll do a tune together now, right? Mm -hmm. All right. All right, what should we do? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, let's do that. All right. Adam Birnbaum, along with Sullivan Fortner.
And I'm starting to believe that these guys didn't tell me the truth, that they knew exactly what they were gonna play. Nope. <laughs> no. Man, that was so beautiful. And I am so excited. I really was happy when you guys said you didn't know. I think sometimes that's when the best, best things happen, when they're just impromptu and you just feel it and you let the spirit just guide you through. So I, I really enjoyed that one. Yeah, I mean, that's jazz. I don't want to get into controversial territory, but <laughs> some, you know, there's lots of different types of jazz music. I play lots of different types, and I actually really love the diversity of playing lots of different musics. But fundamentally, I don't like to think too much. You know, I like to just have um, enough space where you can spontaneously make decisions and, you know, that's the beauty of like Sullivan saying, we all know each other, we all kind of speak a common language. So normally we run into each other all the time, either on the road at different festivals or like in New York, hanging out at clubs and stuff. And so there's sort of like a built-in understanding almost amongst this community of musicians. So it is really nice. Like you can kind of trust each other musically. Absolutely, absolutely. Speaking of and, and trusting during this, <laughs> crazy year and you know sometimes I feel like I don't want to talk about it anymore you know yeah. but <laughs> for this year 2020 have you found that you've learned anything new about yourself and this instrument that you've known for so long I feel like we've all kind of been facing new lessons yeah. throughout this time of course I mean yes uh, it's a reckoning for all of us like to reevaluate what's important in our lives and uh, I think you know music will never, no matter wh whether I can make a living through it or not, music's not going to leave my life. I, I need it. I know that for sure, right? And this kind of helps to affirm that. It's nice to have gigs and stuff, but fundamentally, we just need the music. I think most of us just need it for our own sanity. But at the same time, I've had a lot of time to be with my family this year, and I'm looking at that as a really beautiful, positive side to this kind of nightmare we're in. Um, I'm usually on the road. I have gigs at night when I'm in town, and I don't get to read my kids' stories. You know, like the majority of evenings, I'm I'm out doing something, or I'm just out of town. So, to have however many months it's been now straight since March, every night I'm home. We have dinner together um, until tonight, actually, this first. <laughs> but that's okay. One night is it's worth it. But um, you know, I'm trying to see that as a, as a beautiful, positive side to this whole thing. And eventually we'll all get to make music together again. Yeah. Do you have one of these at home to play with the kids? Do they get on? Oh that? yeah, <laughs> yeah, my son just started, he's gonna be five in January and he's just started taking lessons recently. Nice. So yeah, look out, he's, uh, he knows how to play a couple <laughs> songs now, yeah. All right, I'm gonna have to send my little one over to you to get some lessons then. All right, yeah, no problem. Good, good. Well, I'm gonna head on over to uh, Mr. Sullivan and, and really ask you the same thing because we've all been just trying to figure out ways to live a whole new life. And I'm sure for you all, this is really, really new. I mean, music is, we survive on playing and we survive on playing amongst people and, and being out and about, so what, lesson have you learned or any new connections you've made with your instrument being that you couldn't really go out and be with the people? Um, I think one of the things that that kind of have I've been battling lately is just the idea of playing just for the sake of playing and just playing to have fun and not really trying to meet a deadline or not trying to um, learn someone else's music you know what I mean? <laughs> just playing and just sitting down at the piano and just kind of being reacquainted to it from like a pure place of just play. Um, but have you found that's been the case with just life? <laughs> getting yeah. reacquainted almost with your family, your home more, we're home more. It's like mm -hmm. you're getting reacquainted with even different parts of your home. <laughs> How crazy Yeah, I mean, been? you know, my, my apartment has been my hotel up until this uh, quarantine and now I'm like, buying new furniture and like <laughs> buying knife sets and I'm gonna be go, here a while I guess yeah right? you know I may as well just clean up and see what's what's broken and fix what's broken if I can't fix it I'll just buy something else you know mm -hmm. it's been a lot of lessons definitely oh, yeah. so you all have been just making it happen you've been doing some stuff from home too haven't you I've been doing a few things okay. I've had a few concerts I've done um in the beginning of the pandemic, I did something with Cecile McLaurin Salvant at her apartment, and uh, I've, since then I've done some teaching and some um, some Zoom concerts and stuff. It's been cool. Good old Zoom. Good old Zoom, boy. 
They're making a lot of money now, boy. <laughs> Who would have thought it? I know, yeah. right. But they've definitely helped to keep us alive, I think, in more ways than one. For sure. Yeah, so for sure. we thank them for that. Yes, yeah. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, you Zoom people. <laughs> <laughs> Wherever you, you are. You ready to get... <laughs> Back into some more music. This has been a lot of fun. Yes, it has. You know, it's funny. I'm used to, you know, my first introduction to this music, it was the trumpet through Donald Byrd. But as oh, I've grown, wow. I mean, this is years ago. This has become one of my low-key favorites. I mean, Oscar Peterson, mm. Herbie Hancock, uh, Joe Sample. I mean, this instrument people. does so much. It's 400 years of, of hell. <laughs> 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 well, let's yeah. get back into some, some music, some heavenly music. We're some not going to go to music. hell, though. We, we're going yeah. yeah. to take you to a higher place. All right, let's go. All right. <laughs> let's try. All right. We're going to do a solo this time, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what will I play? I think I might do Rodgers and Hammerstein. Why not? Uh, since we're getting close to the holidays. I'm not going to play a holiday tune, but I like to associate it with, with holidays. Okay. My favorite things. All right. Thank you. 
I feel like the siren comes on every time we're just about finished playing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, to tell us no. Well, the music is that good. I think we're starting, starting little fires everywhere. Yeah, Adam, tell me what, what tune that was. We're going to switch off this time. Yeah, that's I Love You by Cole Porter. Mm -hmm. I've usually played up tempo, so that's played the verse and you know just slowed it down. Um, probably embellished it too much, so you couldn't hear the melody. But you know, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that was a little nod to you know we're here because uh, we're both Cole Porter Fellows of the American Pianist Association, and uh, that takes place in Indianapolis, and uh, Cole Porter is from there, and so it's called the Cole Porter Fellowship. So uh, it's always nice to mix in a tune of his um, in tribute to Joel Harrison, who's uh, retiring this year after a long tenure as the director of American Pianist Association. Um, so we're both here basically thanks to him who kind of helped put this together with you guys. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's, I'm gonna grab that back here. I only have two hands, unless I put the phone here and grab the other one. We're gonna, we're gonna make this happen, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I'm not old school. What were we doing without cell phones? We were supposed to remember things? Terrible. You know, Cole Porter's I Love You is one of my favorites, and I love that I didn't recognize it just now, because that's music. You think you know something, and then you, it, it's, it's, you're always learning. You never know everything. So thank you for playing that that way, because I love that tune, and now I love it in a whole different way. Oh, yeah. yeah. I would love to know, and I, you know, this is kind of a, a question you've heard before, and I, I think it's an answer that might change from time to time, but right now in this moment, I would love to know your top three musical influences. And they don't have to all be pianists, and they don't have to all be jazz, because this music, our influences come from even the fire trucks outside. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've gone through so many phases in my life of uh, imitating various heroes, you know, so when I was younger, it was kind of Oscar Peterson and Keith Jarrett and Herbie Hancock and I don't know, it could just go on and on, you know, but I guess now I'm looking for more uh, lesser influential voices because you can't really, Herbie is so influential, right? There's nothing he's done that hasn't been copied already at this point because he's Herbie, you know, so I've been really into just seeking out as pianists, you know, guys like Jimmy Rolls or Art Landy or like some uh, kind of hidden gems, let's say, that are less known, but really just as incredible musicians as a lot of the better known uh, players and you can learn a lot from them. I've also been really into checking out, I don't know, lately I just love listening to singers and uh, just recently rediscovered Charlie Parker, as obvious as that may be something, all of a sudden I was coming back to some uh, Charlie Parker for a class I'm teaching and it just hit me in a way that solo on Embraceable You that I've listened to a million times, all of a sudden it just like almost put me in tears. It was so beautiful. And so I've been listening to that solo over and over. My wife is like, you can ask her, she's heard it in the car, like kind of became obsessed with it. There's just something about it. It's just so perfect. And one perfect chorus on a ballad. Every note is perfect. So anyway, those are things that lately have been on my mind that are just kind of influencing me that I'm constantly looking for, I guess, new stuff. I don't know if it's possible for you to ever stop having influences when it comes to this music. And like you said, it changes and you find different things from different songs. Don't feel bad about just getting into some Charlie Parker. That's the beauty of this music. We're not supposed to ever feel bad or guilty about just getting into or just discovering. That's the, that's the excitement of it all. I mean, there's, you know, innovators, geniuses like that in the music. You spend your whole life listening to them, and you'll never quite figure it all out anyway because it's just, you know, you know, Bird is always the peak of uh, inventiveness and, you know, everything. Lyricism, all the great things we want in jazz, you know. Absolutely. So I'm going I'm to actually bring it on over to you and ask you that same question. Uh, top three again, in this moment today when you woke up, uh, top three musical influences. Um, and you already spoke about Roy, who had you kind of come here and do the first tune, so maybe give me three others that maybe you've rediscovered or just never even thought you would get into the way you're into now. Um, 
it's kind of weird. Like right now, I've kind of gone to those records with Dionne Warwick and Burt Bacharach. Uh, some of that music, in fact, all of that music, if you ever get a chance, it, for those of you who haven't checked that music out, it's really, 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 really intricate, very, very, um, really deep arrangements <laughs> and deep songwriting. And Dion is just amazing. She's amazing in voice. She's just amazing in interpretation. She's very calm and very relaxed in how she interprets. Um, that's something that I've, I've been into a little bit of some um, Yoruba, uh, Yoruba Bata percussionists and uh, some people from West Africa and Mali and uh, Ghana, just, just uh, different rhythms, just trying to get some different rhythms in my head and you know exploring that. Um, I've also been into Sun Ra lately, and um, particularly um, there have been a few of his earlier recordings that I've been kind of discovering through the help of a great pianist, Rodney Kendrick. And um, yeah, he's really kind of blowing my mind right now. Um, so those are the three that, that have kind of like been on my radar the last few weeks. Yeah. I mean, I'm taking notes. Now I'm going to have to uh, add the, some of those. I mean, we're always playing uh, Charlie Parker. We, you know, we've always had some Sun Ra in there, but I'm going to have to dive into that Dion Warwick. That's a little different. But it's amazing. Uh, again, and, and events like this, I, I love doing them because I learn from you all, too. You know, it's like you pick, I think I'm getting my brain picked here, just really getting information from you and Charlie Parker and... Dion and Sun Ra, the music is really just two categories. Didn't Duke say that, good and bad? We don't have to really label it down the way that we do. We just gotta enjoy it and feel it when it's good, right? Mm -hmm. So I really hope that you members have enjoyed it and felt all of this good music. We're actually winding down. They say time flies when you're having fun. I think we've been having too much fun. So I'm gonna let them get into their last song, but I have some great folks to thank because we could never do this alone. So thank you to Bonnie, Hillary, Aaron, and Makia from Yamaha. Also, we have to thank Joel Harrison and his team. You just mentioned Joel uh, from the American Pianist Association. Thank you for these guys, almost, right? I mean, you would have been here anyway, but that competition really just introduced you in a sense to the people. So thank you for that. And also, I can't forget to thank my team. My wonderful team, Chris and John from WBGO. These guys make things happen, and we thank you, members, because the music lives on because of you and your support. So what are you guys going to take us out with? Do you know? Remember, this is all impromptu, so they're going to discuss it. I heard Monk. All right. Thelonious Monk. We're going to close out with one of the greats, and... We've got some greats that are gonna bring the great. We've got Sullivan Fortner one more time. Round of applause, yeah. And also Adam Birnbaum. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. And thank you again, members, for your time. Enjoy the music.